like a serving type thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess that would be my geek out is my glass serving tray this week. So since we're live, ta-da! <laughs> that's cool. that's my, my nerd out for today. But uh, welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Kayleen, joined as always by my good friend, Scott, who is founder of Sefka. And, you know, we start off uh, a little bit while we're waiting to go live geeking out about things. So first off, Scott, how are you doing this week? I am doing great. Yeah, it's so good afternoon. to see you. Hey, I did. I wanted to tell you really quickly. I had to use an electrician yesterday. Um, I circuit break tech tripping in the house. Normally, I'm thinking out about tackle projects by myself. But when it comes to electrical, that's kind of where I draw the line. And so we um, we can call an electrician in and he came in and changed out all of our, what we had, you'll appreciate this. We had what we call start circuit breakers and apparently they trip too easily. Um, and so he, he, he switched them out with standard circuit breakers and he said, this should do the trick. They shouldn't trip anymore. He had to switch out about five of them, but um, yeah. So it's kind of interesting. It's always interesting to use, you know, construction services. And I got to do that yesterday. That is awesome. You know, and talk about essential services. And really, it's something that I think as a homeowner, it's important to know a little bit of this information. You know, you could take it onto a career or if nothing else, you're a better consumer. So, you know, speaking of taking it onto a career, Scott, you have one of my favorite books of all time. Um, can you please talk about the book that was produced with um, the Mercedes-Benz Stadium Project? Yes, you know, I always love to share this and it sits in a proud spot on my bookshelf uh, here in Atlanta. And this is a book, you know, we, we ended up putting 170 of our graduates in stadium. And to help remember that, we put together this coffee table book. We made it specifically for Arthur Blank, who is the owner of the Atlanta Falcons. And, but we obviously printed extra copies for our staff and we our graduates. And it's just a coffee table book with some really cool images, I'll show you, of, of some of our graduates that worked on the project. And it's a great photographer one day to go out there and take pictures of our graduates, you know, doing their jobs, you know, on the stadium. And it's just a fun, and this, this is actually a signed copy, signed by Arthur Blank, who is the owner of the Atlanta Falcons. He signed it for us. And I keep it in a very office. And it's just a great reminder, of part of that amazing project. So yeah, it's it's something I always love to share. Anybody comes over, I say, hey, let me show you something. And I tell them all about the book. So yeah, a lot of fun. Thank you for letting me share that. Yes, absolutely. Well, I love the process. You know, you are giving people the opportunity to go through uh, the Construction Ready program and then work on one of the coolest projects in the US. I mean, the... The engineering behind it is so cool. The architecture is off the It's just not like, oh, cool, you're building a building. You know, oh, no, no, this is way better. Well, and check this out, Kayleen. That project was amazing. It was about $1.7 billion. Well, there's a development here in Atlanta right now called the Yards Project. And that meant is about $5 billion over the next I think 15 years. So it's basically going to be like three Mercedes-Benz stadiums in downtown Atlanta. So it's an exciting industry uh, to be in. And that's what, you know, what SEFC is all about is getting people excited about the construction industry. And a big part of that is, is what our guest is with us uh, today to talk about. And, that, um, and that's one of the sectors that is on fire right now in our industry is, you know, more people, I think, are spending time at home. And yeah. so they're having to, you know, remodel their homes to make them more usable in this environment. I'm sure that Doug will talk about it, but I'm sure there are a lot of uh, new office spaces being, you know, remodeled into homes, um, you know, uh, bedrooms being turned into offices, maybe maybe needing multiple offices in one house. So it's a, it's a busy sector. And I'm just so happy that we have Doug with us today to talk about it. Yes, me too. You know, I come out of the residential sector. And so it makes me happy because now, especially working with students, I get to tell them we make pieces of art people live in. 
you know, it's it's a fun it's a fun sector in the industry. And so getting to uh, geek out with Doug, I mean, I'm just a big fan of Nary in general, but it's nice inspiring people at every angle. You know, maybe it's someone watching this who's sitting at home being like, gosh, somebody did put this together, you know, or someone like you is like, OK, um, you know, I need work done. Let me hire an electrician. And I think having that little bit of knowledge too, like, okay, I, this is this is not something I should do. That is so good to know. <laughs> I, I've definitely seen people who who think otherwise, and so yeah, I'm very excited to chat about today's guest, and hopefully, hopefully, a lot of people. Um, I think I had a little bit of a breakup. Can you say the name again of um, the the project, the five billion dollar project? What is that? Yeah, it's called Centennial Yards, and it's here in Atlanta. It's basically a big swath of land in downtown Atlanta, several city blocks that is undeveloped. It, it tracks along basically railroad tracks in downtown Atlanta, and it goes very close to Mercedes-Benz Stadium and also uh, Phillips Arena. Actually, it's called State Farm Arena now where the Atlanta Hawks play. And it's just going to be a big sort of mixed use development of retail, uh, office space, um, residential, that sort of thing. And so, and it's a five billion with a B, five billion dollar development over the next 15 years. It's going to bring thousands of new jobs to Atlanta. And we're going to be putting a lot of our graduates on that project. So we'll be making another book one day, I'm sure, about the Centennial Yards project and all of the graduates who helped build that. So definitely looking forward to it. I absolutely love it because there is such pride about, you know, last week, um, the guest we talked about how <laughs> when you drive by a project, it's like, oh, I worked on that. Oh, I worked on that. And, you know, to, to take part in such transformation of the city you live in has tremendous opportunities. So, you know, with that in mind, um, where can folks find out more information if they want to get signed up for a construction ready program to perhaps take part in this amazing bill? Absolutely. So there are two places. Our main website is cefga.org, C-E-F-G-A.org. And then we also have another site called constructionready.org. So you can get to us either way. Uh, Construction Ready is a great program. We can get you trained um, and working on a project like Mercedes-Benz Stadium or Centennial Yards one day. And so, you know, we just love to have you join our industry and, and you know, and, and feel what it's like to be part of a big project that you can take people by and, and brag about. Because it is, even me, I didn't help build Mercedes-Benz Stadium, but we put, um, you know, 170 people on that project. So I I feel a sense of pride knowing that we indirectly help build it. And, and even, you know, when I see the stadium on TV or I drive by it here in Atlanta, it's always such a, a, a great sense of accomplishment, even for me. And I didn't, I didn't drive a single nail or, or anything on the project, but just helping people, you know, helping people who helped build it was, uh, was pretty amazing. So. Oh, big time because it's, I don't know, we're part of a team and a process. And I don't know, I think that's something that's really nice to um, be a part of. So um, hang on, I'm, I'm bad at multitasking. Here's something else I've learned is that I'm so much better at power tools than I am at technology. <laughs> and um, uh, our guest is having issues right now with logging on to the Zoom call. And so he is trying, I just got a text from him and he's, um, He's not quite sure on what is happening. So my awesome, awesome, awesome friends, hey Mitch and Kim, I'll break in the fourth wall. So we're gonna try to get him on in a moment. Well, while we're waiting, Kayleen, I wanted to share one other thing uh, about the story I told earlier. We had the electrician come to our house yesterday and I'll just put out a word. Um, it was SD Services here in Atlanta. They're, they're not currently a sponsor of SEPCA's, so I'm not showing favor to any one company, but they did a job. And I always, I always ask when a tradesman comes or a tradesperson comes to my house to do work, I always ask him, how did you get into the industry? I'm always curious. And this young man, he's an electrician. He's been an electrician for seven years. Um, he said, you know, I took the traditional route. I went to college straight out of high school. He said, I hated it. It just wasn't for me. And he said, I actually went to a different college. I thought maybe the college wasn't right. I went to a different college. He said, that didn't work. So I realized I needed another path. And he said he enrolled in Southern Crescent Technical College here in Georgia and found the electric, electric program. And he said he never looked back. He said he found his calling. 
when he started doing electrical work, he knew that was exactly what he wanted to do. And he ended up going to work with Estes uh, here in Atlanta. And he's a, an electrician. And he's 28 years old. And he was funny. He said, the only thing I wish is that I had discovered it earlier. He said, I wish I had found it straight out of high school. And um, I said, but, you know, I said, that's what we do as an organization. Young people find their, their passion and their path. Uh, and I said, but really, you found it pretty early. He found it at about 21. I said, I said, most people, it takes them 10 years. You know, they'll find it at 27 or 28. So I said, hey, you found it at 21 and you have seven years under your belt as an electrician. And he was just, I could tell he just loved what he, what he does. You know, he loved coming in and helping people get their power back. And, um, and then I give him a shout out. His name was Jonathan Kaufman with S Services here in Atlanta. And just great young guy. And I'm going to personally ask for him anytime I need electrical service because he did a really great job. So. That is such an awesome uh, lift up and I love it. I hope that um, he, you know, gets, uh, let's see, uh, what's a good pun? Uh, he's electrified when he finds out. I absolutely love it. <laughs> he's charged. He's charged. Right. He yeah. did find it young. You know, the fact that he got into it at 21 because the average now is late 20s, 30s. And so we need to start getting that back, um, kind of swing the pendulum back so we get students a bit younger to get excited about this. Yeah, well, because it's a win for everyone, right? I mean, if we get them younger, they get started early, right on a really productive path. And they can, it gives them more time to advance in the industry, right? Because they learn a trade, but now they can become a manager or a supervisor or heck, he was even talking talking about one day owning his own business potentially, you know, and that we see that all the time in our industry. Um, you can climb as high as you want to climb. It's just based on how much you want to learn and how hard you want to work. Yeah. And you make as much money as you want to make. It is in any part of the industry. And I'm so excited that uh, Doug King is able to join. Hey, Doug, how's it going? Hey there. Oh, there he is. Um, so I Scott- what happened. I was out in virtual world somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Oh, hey, power tools over technology still is my, my mantra. That's right. Um, That's right. But real quick, Scott, thanks for chatting with me. And you're going to be hanging out to the end, right, to answer any questions. I will. I'll be back to chat a little bit at the end. Awesome. Sweet. Cool. Thank you. Um, I am so excited to be joined by this week's guest, Doug King, who is a friend of mine, too. But, Doug, you are with NARI, the National Association of the Modeling Industry. Um, and I am... I'm a nerd for the group. Can you please tell me a little bit about Nary? And then also, what is your title now? Because I just want to say, like, you are the coolest at the top. I'm not quite sure how to how to be professional about it. <laughs> yeah, well, as of uh, two weeks ago, I became chairman of the board. I was the president for the last term. Our our terms run April to April. So now I'm, I'm chair of the board. So I'm in my final year as an officer for, for Nary. But, uh, but, but Nary, is a, it's a great group. It's a nationwide group. It's got about 40 chapters. Um, nationwide, and it consists of anybody, any company, I should say, that has anything to do with remodeling, whether it's a supplier providing products or a contractor like myself, anybody that's related at all to a home for remodeling that can be a member of NARI. And uh, we have a lot of, you know, we, we have strict requirements, we have background checks for our members, and we have a code of ethics we require everybody to work towards. So we're very proud of our membership, and we, in return, our members get a lot from the group. From the things that all the services that we that we offer and some of that stuff we'll talk about today i hope <laughs> oh big time no it is it's a wonderful group you know just outside of it's the network it's the making everybody love the industry a bit more okay so yep. i'm a nerd for it though you are too let's break it down though for our fans a little bit um what is the simplest way to explain the difference between remodeling and other construction well, I guess it's that, you know, building from a flat piece of dirt is pretty easy. I, I've done that, so I, I know. Uh, but digging into a building structure to replace pieces and parts uh, while keeping the building safe and secure uh, for the occupants, keeping out water, keeping out rodents, and not destroying the parts and the pieces that we're trying to replace is very difficult. It takes a lot of planning. Uh, the projects are always full of unknowns. And uh, we're kind of like an artist and a surgeon, if you will. Uh, we have to blend things in and make them look beautiful while keeping everything else intact and working. I absolutely love that. It's true. We are an artist and a surgeon. And I've seen yeah. surgeons use, you know, a cordless sawzall. So 
It's the same. It's the same tool. Yeah. Um, so how did you get into the remodeling industry? How did you start? Well, oddly enough, I, I answered a newspaper ad. It doesn't get any simpler than that, does it? <laughs> no, no, it is. that's how it works. Yes. Yeah. I had, um, my career was always, I was in the corporate world. And I traveled all over North America uh, for about 20 years and uh, in the packaging business, but I'd always, I'd always been a do-it-yourselfer. I'd always remodeled my own homes and did stuff for friends. And so when this came up, opportunity came up, I was tired of traveling and um, I wish I'd gotten into it when I was in my 20s. No kidding. Yeah. You know, Scott and I were talking about that earlier, that the earlier we can get people excited about this, they have such success for long-term career, oh, you yeah. know? Oh my I'd God. I'd be retired by now if I started earlier. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that we all would. Dang it. <laughs> um, so, you know, in the past with this show, we've talked about uh, the, the various jobs because a lot of folks still think it's just going onto a job site with your tool belt and that's construction. Right. It's not. Um, so what are some of the jobs that are essential to a, a successful remodeling project? Well, as you know, there are dozens of them, mm -hmm. uh, but usually for remodeling, most often you're going to have a plumber, you're going to have an air conditioning guy, you're going to have an electrician, a carpenter, and a painter almost always, always needed. Then you've got the exterior building components. You've got uh, roofers, siding people, masonry, stucco, um, and all that. But let's also not forget about the folks that are involved up front. We have designers, project managers, architects, and estimators that are on the front end. So it's not just about swinging a hammer or being a, a carpenter or a, a crucial uh, trade craft person. There's a lot of different components that go into a remodeling job. So it takes a lot of people to, to make it happen and make it happen <laughs> right. <laughs> I love that you mentioned this because believe it or not, uh, some television shows make it look like it happens in a half an hour with three or four people and that's yeah. just not the case. And yeah. so it is nice to talk about, you know, you do. And I, I want uh, folks watching to understand that this is almost for every size project, you know, this you need to employ a various set of skills, even if it's a tiny bathroom or a giant basement, you know, because right. it's a set of skills. So do people um, work for a remodeling <clears throat> company or is the work typically subcontracted? How does that work? Well, that's a good question because there's a, there's a lot of different business models out there. Um, you know, a lot of the trades like electrician, plumbers, the specialty trades are usually subcontracted out because as a remodeler, we can't keep those folks busy every single day, every single minute. And they, they are expensive, they get paid well. And so if you're listening and you want a nice career to make some money, you should definitely look into that. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's common for a remodeling company to hire carpenters who have a wide variety of skills that can do a lot of different things. Carpentry work, both finish and rough, uh, maybe some drywall work, some small amount of painting, maybe you can hook up a faucet. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a, uh, a need for a wide variety of, of skill levels for every, every single day for both men and women out there in this, in this business. I, yes. And you know, really talking about yeah, electricians and plumbers, because you do kind of set your own schedule. You work between a lot of great general contractors, see some great yeah. stuff. So oh, if I had known the tool, I would have a whole lot less tools. I would have, yeah. I would have put a plumber in a heartbeat. Um, you know, tools are fun. We, H2 well. <laughs> We talk about obviously all the skill involved with it, but do remodelers need special <laughs> certifications? Well, that's, I guess that depends on where they work. Uh, a lot of states do have requirements for licenses and whatnot. Um, certainly in my opinion, if you're gonna work in somebody's home, and let's keep in mind that a home for most people is a single largest investment of a lifetime. Yes. So if you're gonna go in there and work, you should know what you're doing. Uh, you should have both a hands-on uh, experience and some knowledge gained from taking courses and maybe attending webinars like Nary or seeing here on the screen now, um, those are great places to go and, and get continuing education. And, you know, and, and continuing education is important in any career, not just this one, but anything you do. Uh, Nary has a tremendous amount of educational opportunities for our members. And um, that, that's to me is one of the great benefits from the, from the national level to help our, help our members out. It, it is spectacular and talking about continuing education, especially now, I'm seeing the industry employ so much technology that was not on the job site 20 years ago. So even just that, but, you know, making sure that we're keeping our best practices nice and sharp. Um, so real quick, Doug, can you tell us the, the best website for folks to check out some of the information they're seeing right now? 
Well, uh, nari.org, N-A-R-I.org, and if you scroll along the top there and hit the uh, certification accreditation buttons, and the then you scroll down, you see the certifications there. Uh, it's a good place. Under the education button as well, uh, back at the top, will lead you to the, web, the webinars. And again, uh, in the outreach and toolkit is really great for, uh, for uh, uh, students to take a look at. Those are all things that for our members are a discounted price. Uh, if you're not a member, you can still participate, but it's going to cost you a little bit more. And we actually have it kind of geared to that. If you become a member, it makes you know, financial sense to do it. But you're talking about technology, this, you know, right here, this for, for a lot of us older folks, this was just a telephone. Uh, and, and for kids, they do everything on these. This is now a tool for us. And, and the smart reminders will pursue those apps and download them and use it. Yes. Totally. Oh, big time. And I, I really encourage a lot of folks to check out membership with Mary because it's a great group of people. I can't yeah. wait until we could do stuff. And Doug, I'm so bummed that your whole presidency was through COVID. Oh, you it's been it's been horrible. I haven't been able to visit any of our chapters do anything. It's been just uh, not a fun time to do it, but I was I was glad to serve and help steer us through the the you know the, the murky waters that we had to deal with. Yes. The past 12, 18 months. Well, and especially now, you know, let's, so let's dive in because let's talk about the industry. Um, I'm, I could bounce all over the place, but let's start back to the basics because, oh my gosh, doing remodeling. I really think more people should start in remodeling because you learn so much more. You're right. Yeah. Coming from the ground up. Mm -mm. Uh, yeah. a, a lot of remodeling is mm, problem solving, I guess, but how do you work with the problem that you're uncovering and then still keeping on track with the project you're working on? How, how do you not deal with scope creep? Yeah, well, there, there's that's kind of, I guess, two different things. One is that when you uncover an unknown, and it's, if it's in the work area that we're supposed to be remodeling, uh, we've got to deal with it because we can't just ignore it. So if it involves structural, we'll, we'll bring an engineer and get them involved in it. Uh, but whatever it is, we'll sit down and we evaluate what's going on. We'll, we'll uh, come up with a plan and then a scope of work and then a price for the client. And of course, they have to agree to that price before we move forward. Uh, it makes just common sense. Everybody's got to be on the same page with what it is. Um, especially here in Florida, we have very strict codes. So we have to bring it uh, up to code if it's uh, in our work area. If it's not in there, we don't, we're not required to. So then it becomes an option. And if a homeowner wants to do it, we'll give them a price and then, of course, we'll do it. But we got to keep in mind that we're there to do the original scope of work, and um, we strive hard to not change the, the the appearance that we were shooting for to begin with. We do everything we can to keep that intact so that we still get to the end result. Um, but we'll keep working wherever we can. Sometimes the issue might be off to the side. We can keep on going with uh, with the the main structure that we were working on to begin with in place. It is, it's definitely now, you know, trying to manage scope treat and keeping on track because I've seen with the COVID and lockdown, prices are through the roof. Contractors are insanely busy. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, first of all, the lumber prices are shocking. How are you even bidding jobs now? Well, we have to put in um, escalation clauses in our contract. So we basically say, it's good for 30 days. We might say it's good for two weeks. Depends on how much lumber is in there. If it's a lot of lumber, you got to really protect yourself because really and truly I can get guarantees for about a week and that's about it. Wow. Um, almost wow. everything has gone up. It's really crazy. All the all the manufacturing of building materials, windows, doors, cabinetry, building, you know, the lumber you just mentioned is all oh, it's crazy. Not only has it gone up in price, but it's taking longer to get. And um, well, I think one of your questions we may talk about in a minute is going to address that and how important it is for the remodeler that we keep on top of this stuff because it can absolutely sink us if we're not careful. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and um, a quick side tangent. I just think this is such an interesting time in the construction industry. Um, does NARI offer any type of scholarships or internships for students to check out the industry, especially now? Uh, at the national level, we don't really have that scholarship right now. Some of the chapters have that locally, and that way the members that are uh, more intimately involved at that level, would, usually it's uh, an employee's or a member's employee's uh, child that that scholarship goes to because they have some exposure to the industry, so they'll, they'll have that. Uh, we do have a, a new membership. We do have student memberships, by the way. We also have uh, memberships 
so that we used to require you had to be in business for a year. And we realized that a lot of the new business owners was typically a, a stat for you is that half of all remodeling companies fail within the first two years. So we at Nary feel like, hey, let's help those people out. Let's go and let them be a provisional member for that first year. They can't vote, but they are a member and they get exposed to all of our resources. They get exposed to all the other great members that have already been through those battles and can help them out. You know, <gasps> And survive. I love yes. it. It's, it's so good because we've lost the meaning and concept of mentorship and how important it is, especially in this industry. I mean, yes. I Doug, personally, I think running a remodeling company is the hardest job ever because sometimes you're on the job site working, you have to bid, you have to like, you have to keep the ball rolling and it is insanely difficult. Yeah. Um, so what, what is your best advice for making it in this industry? Well, you know, a lot of people start off in this business that, that came up through the ranks and they, they do great work at remodeling, but really and truly it becomes a business. So you cannot be a finished carpenter and a business owner at the same time. That's very difficult. If you don't manage the daily financial operations of your business, you won't make it. You'll become that statistic I was talking about. So I encourage people uh, when there is a lot of courses that we have that help people with that, but you should hire somebody to either help you through that. Certainly take some courses on your own and learn how to manage finances because especially with today's building material prices. And in fact, it takes so long to get when you sign a contract, it might be months before you're able to put something in. And if your draw payment is based on the fact that you don't get paid until that's installed, but you had to order it, pay for it up front you're going to create a cash crunch for yourself. So you have to learn how to plan cash flow. Cash flow is absolutely the lifeline of any business and especially in our business right now with all this craziness going on. So if you don't, if you don't know that, don't understand it, get somebody that does on staff or hire them as you need them because um, that's absolutely the number one reason that the businesses fail in our business. They don't fail because they can't hang a door right or put a window in. They fail because of the money. Yes. No, you're right. I worked with a trim carpenter who didn't finish fifth grade, but was brilliant. I mean, he could, oh my gosh, you know, you want a cove ceiling done, you know, couldn't do taxes, couldn't do his own business, you yeah. know. <laughs> I love the fact that you can't do both. It's impossible. Right. Yeah. Unless, unless you have a, a 50 hour day. Right. Um, so besides that, as far as setting yourself up for a, a success with a good team, you know, we talk a lot on this show, too, about some of the skills we need outside of that, not necessarily how to use a saw or a hammer, but some of the right. softer skills. What traits are you looking for in an employee? Well, you got to be able to communicate both orally and in writing. So you got you got to know how to write because uh, some things you do in this business. Well, I shouldn't say some. <laughs> Almost <laughs> all of what we do has got to be in writing. Otherwise, it's just it's a basis for arguments. But yes. you've also got to be able to talk on site so when things come up things happen that you can speak with your owner and turn around and ride around and speak with an employee or, or with a sub and communicate exactly what the heck it is that needs to be done and you got to do that with a calmness you can't get upset you got to be patient with people uh our client is the emotional homeowner so they're going to be very emotional about what it is especially when you're asking them to spend more money it's not going to be a fun conversation so you've got to have a personality you can deal with all types and you've got to be patient and you've got to be understanding and more importantly than ever, ever in this world right now is respect for everyone, respect for your client, respect for your employees, respect for your subs, and most of all, respect for yourself. I love those words of wisdom, Doug. It's so true, you know, um, gosh, and really, you know, finding value in it, respecting everyone. Uh, first of all, we don't have enough people around anyways, too, so respect your subs. Really respect yes. yourself. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so, you know, I, I, I am sure a lot of people watching this have remodeled something inside of your house. And I really like how you talked about communication and patience. You know, it's, it's critical. You are, you're dealing yes. with an emotional client. It's true. Right. It's a fact. How does, how does Nary train people to work so closely with their customers? Well, the, the, all the courses that we have, um, cover a wide variety of topics and they can be webinars or they can be uh, some of the courses that we actually offer in the education department. Uh, like we encouraged last year everybody to develop a COVID-19 statement to let homeowners feel comfortable and know what you were going to do to protect them when you came into their house. In addition, our code of ethics also kind of sets a standard operate by to make sure employees are background checked, uh, follow company procedures, 
uh, keep it, you know, you want to keep the home safe and secure. Uh, you know, this business isn't rocket science. Uh, it does require a lot of strategic thinking and the planning for the thousands and thousands of details that are involved, which just really, quite frankly, includes a lot of very just simple common sense. And like I said a while ago, respect for others. Yes. Oh my gosh. I love it. You know, it really is setting up remodelers for success because it's an industry that's so critical. You know, I don't, yes. I've seen some really bad work done by homeowners who think that they can Google it and figure it yeah. out. And alas, don't always trust what you read on the internet. <laughs> yeah. um, Doug, this has been absolutely fantastic and really, really informative. Can you say again, the website where folks can go to find out more information if they'd like membership or to check out other opportunities? Absolutely. The, it's called the National Association of the Remodeling Industry, and the website is www.nari.org. I, I love it. And, you know, real quick, on the, on the site right now, can you tell me a little bit about the Cody Awards? What are those? Yeah, so that's an opportunity for us to showcase our work. We enter at the, at the uh, local level, and we can also enter at the national level. And we have, they, they award um, awards by award awards they they judge it by by region so if you went a first place in a region then you go on to national and it's just a chance to showcase your product while ago you were seeing some things on the screen there with that was an actual entry of mine part of an entry we get up to 30 slides and it what you have to do is show what the homeowner wanted to do the obstacles that you encountered during it during the project how you overcame those and what you, in the end did you meet the homeowner needs and did you follow all the normal rules of you know construction remodeling all that good stuff and for design and, you know, so it gives you an opportunity to really get your work out there and, and show it off. And it's a great marketing tool. And uh, this particular one you're seeing right now, I won a national first place for that one. And that was uh, a beachfront condo. That was a well fun job. And, you know, it was, uh, I like to show that. <laughs> yes, heck yes, because it's, you know, also it's Pinterest worthy, you know, yeah. when you're seeing the Cody Awards. So, you know, if you're looking at having some remodeling projects done, if you see a contractor with a Cody Award, you know, oh my word, something great is happening. Yeah. So Doug, thank you again so much for taking the time to hang out. This was awesome to Thanks. catch up and hear, hear what's going on. Always um, good to chat with you, Kayleen. Yes, no, this is great. I can't wait to see you again in Florida in, in the real time. And um, Come on down. <laughs> <laughs> great. Yes, excellent. Fishing, please, and warm weather. I'm ready for it. I'm, I'm absolutely done. And so, um, so, Scott, what did you think? This was some great information about the residential side of construction. That, absolutely. I enjoyed uh, Doug's comments. You know, I, I have a selfish question to ask him. I've often thought if I were going to get into construction, I would love to do restoration, you know, of old buildings. You know, here in Georgia, we have great cities like Savannah that have these great old houses. And I've just always thought it would be fun. So is there a difference between restoration and remodeling? Or like Mary, do you have members who are more into restoration and they focus on, you know, old buildings? What's the what's that look like? Yeah, that's, that is a good question because that is, there is a difference there. Uh, restoration of old buildings, you have to have some knowledge of how the construction was done during that particular period when that building was constructed. And of course, having knowledge of if it's been remodeled or updated, even if it was 50 years ago, maybe it was built in the late 1800s, but it was redone 50 years ago. You got to understand how that might've been done because you can go in there and cut the wrong thing and the house comes tumbling down or the, or the building collapses. So. It's definitely different. I, we do have some members that kind of specialize in that. Uh, here in my area, we, you know, we don't have hardly any homes much before the 1900s. Mm -hmm. um, so I, it's kind of hard to say that it's a, uh, it's a historical remodel here with, with only being 100 years old. But <laughs> definitely you, you, it's a different mindset. And you really, that, that to me, if you're going to start out in remodeling, that would not, in my opinion, would not be a good place to start because there's too much that you would have to know beforehand. Yeah, you have to really, yeah, I would think you have to have a really advanced level of, of knowledge and experience. Yes. I mean, you wouldn't put a beginning carpenter in a 150 year old house, right? I mean, no. you want to make sure whoever you put in there knows exactly what they're doing. Right. <laughs> Start off with a bathroom first. <laughs> <laughs> the closet, yes. <laughs> no doubt. Well, hey, Doug, we appreciate your leadership too. We know you're busy running a a company, but you also volunteer your time with Neri. And I always admire business people who are able to do both of those things to run a successful business. 
but also give back to your industry and your community, you know, through leadership. And I just, I want to say thank you for that. We have a, that, that's how SEFCA operates here. We have people on our board, we're a nonprofit and we rely on presidents and CEOs of companies who donate their time. So right. even though you're in Florida and we're in Georgia, we appreciate what you do for the industry down there and nationwide. Well, I'm glad to do it. And I appreciate you saying that. Yes, sir. I got cool friends. Thanks, God. Thanks, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this was this was absolutely fabulous. Um, Scott, thanks for coming back on board. If any folks have any questions, always feel free to text Career Path to 31996 and then join us next week where we're going to be joined by Aisha. Hislop, I'm not quite, I'm, I can't wait to figure out how to pronounce her last name. Um, and she's with the Association <laughs> of Career and Technical Education and all about promoting CTE. And I'm very, very excited to geek out about it, that again. So Doug, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time for lunch again, and we'll see you in the future time. Yes, thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> thank you, Kayleen. Have a great Thanks, day. Bye-bye. Bye, see you soon.